dude, if we can come up with a lending structure that there's no paperwork or, or there's minimal paperwork, minimal background, like we, we care about the deal. Do the numbers make sense? Because in the end, if things don't work, I'm not going to get stuck with the borrower. I'm going to get stuck with their, their project that, that fails in one way or another. Welcome back to What's the Good News is the best insider look into the most influential individuals in the real estate industry as a whole. And I'm your host, Michael Smith, and this is my co-host, Mr. Dominic Cardarelli, who is one of the best closers I know. Dom and I have over 20 years of real estate experience, and we always love sharing the good news. Today, we have on the show a friend and colleague, Mr. Luke Taylor. Luke Taylor started his career as a NASDAQ market maker in New York City, and while trading, he accumulated enough income to start purchasing investment properties. In 2010, he started buying properties in West Philly and was able to accumulate a sizable portfolio that still cash flows. In 2016, Luke and his partner started Crowdcopia, which is an asset-based lending company who are still lending today. Luke, what is the good news? Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. As always, looking good, sounding good. Um, uh, yeah, good news is uh, starting to feel a little stabilization here. Um, it's been it's been a rough patch, as everybody knows. Um, once the interest rates cranked up so much, you know, doubled in most cases or more, uh, kind of put a cramp or a crimp on everything. And um, for, I would say for you know for a good year now, it's been relatively slow. Um, numbers are not shaking out on deals, but for the first time, I'm I'm finally seeing. I said it's probably about a week and a half, two weeks ago, started seeing a um, couple of loans coming in that looked like they were, you know, hey, these are not these are not bad numbers, realistic ARVs. Um, so, you know, I'm hoping uh, that things are starting to kind of, you know, bottom out a little bit here and uh, put in a little base. And, and while I don't think, that, you know, prices are going up, uh, I don't think they're going to really go down as much anymore. Yeah, I would completely agree. I don't know if you know this, Luke, but uh, you issued with Crowdcopia my first proof of funds letter ever in real estate. <laughs> that was, uh, I think that was what, like 2017 or something? This has been a while. Yeah, that sounds about, yeah, sounds familiar. Yeah, you issued the first one, man. You didn't even ask any questions. You were like, oh, Mike referred you? Oh, yeah, you're good. Let's go. <laughs> Send the deal over. It was, it was yeah. great. Easy, easiest process I've ever had with a lender, too, by the way. You guys like really changed the game though, Luke. Like when you guys first started, you were doing what? Like two points, you're funding pretty much 100% of everything if it appraised for 65%, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, well, so so kind of, so the, the thing was, was um, myself and my partners, John and Craig, we had been buying real estate in West, you know, they were the guys I was doing stuff in West Philly with. Um, I had another partner of mine who was kind of like a, more of a silent guy, but um the background was finding houses. You know, I, used to, I used to go into Philly. I lived in Hoboken at the time. And I used to drive to my to Craig's house and we would go look at I mean, anywhere from a dozen to like 20 houses at a clip. And, you know, we started buying houses. So we learned how to find them. And then we started renovating. So we learned how to build them. And then we started renting them. So we learned how to, how to rent them and how to manage them. And, uh, you know, all of that, Put together um, in 2016, the the West Philly market was really starting to pick up, and pricing was starting to increase quite a bit, and was throwing our, our renting model off. So uh, we originally looked at crowdfunding, uh, which is hence uh, Crowdcopia, uh, but we decided we were better off as more of like a hard money lender, and with the background in construction, background in in management, and the ability to you know, at this point, we, between me and my partners, probably purchased and rehab, you know, 250 to 300 something houses at that point and paid attention the whole time. So when we would bring in new lenders um, or new borrowers, rather, we would use our background to help them. And yeah, so we felt very cavalier. We could do 65% LTV. We could do 100% of, of, of uh, you know, the purchase and of the rehab. And as long as, the pro as long as the project made sense to us, if it was something that we wouldn't mind doing ourselves, we, we, you know, we would fund it. At the time, I was also trying to get a home equity line of credit on my house. And 
after supplying you know, 40 some odd documents and to, to a bank that I already had a mortgage with, just to keep in mind, uh, I got really frustrated and annoyed. And I spoke with John and was like, dude, if we can come up with a lending structure that there's no paperwork or, or there's minimal paperwork, minimal background, like we, we care about the deals. Do the numbers make sense? Because in the end, if things don't work, I'm not going to get stuck with the borrower. I'm going to get stuck with their their project that, that failed in one way or another. So I want to know I can take care of the project. And knowing I can take care of the project meant I didn't have to scrutinize the borrower quite as much. It was it was funny. I um, you know, my project in Massachusetts, when I was talking to lenders about that, I'm like, what do you mean you don't fund a hundred percent of everything and you need more than two points? I was like, well, what do you mean? Like you had set the standard. Like I thought that was the norm, right? And I was like, oh shit, Luca actually did us some solids. That's freaking crazy. So yeah, you kind of uh, kind of fucked me up a little there, Luke, because I thought everything was going to be that great, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know, that's so we'll keep from coming back. They go, they go somewhere else. And then they, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know a significant amount of people that have borrowed from you and always had good results, and I as well have. So. It is a very simple process and it is it's an asset, straight up asset based lending. And if the project is good, you know, why not do the deal? So um, let's back yeah. up a little bit. Can you talk about your first project and what that looked like, whether it was a personal or your first venture into real estate? And can you talk about how you bought it and the financing and how it turned out? Yeah. Um, so I, I bought my first building in 2001 uh, in Jersey City, um, it was 61 Wayne Street. I'll never forget it. Um, I had no idea what I was doing or getting into, but I had saved up um, some money because I was trading. And at that time, you know, I had no wife, I had no kids, I had no responsibilities really. Um, and traders did well. So, um, I bought a four family building and uh, thought, hey, this is great. I'm just going to, you know, my dad was a carpenter. I'll have him help me out. I, you know, I know how to do some stuff around the house. And after about a month, I was like, dad, you got to help me get rid of this thing. I don't know what to do. Um, and, you know, uh, I was kind of floundering a little. And then I, and this is, I, I, I swear God takes care of fools. Um, I got very lucky and I got a call from the broker that sold me the house. Uh, and he said, Hey, listen, these two investors or this, this investment company, like saw your property, they thought you bought it like really, really well. And they're wondering if you're looking for a partner. So, uh, I was like, yeah, definitely. Um, they were very excited about doing all the work. Um, I was very excited about not doing anything, um, but trying to kind of learn from, from what they were doing. And, um, and, and then, and where I got lucky was they came in, they gave me all the money that I put down originally into the project. And then we were 50, 50 partners on the, on whatever was left when we were done. And, uh, and I hung out for the next nine months and I went to the site almost, nah, I'm not going to say every day, but as much as I could. And I learned about foundations and I learned about footers and I learned about a, t a tremendous amount of what goes into a house. And, uh, and that's why I got lucky because they came in, they were, they, they were kind, they, they taught me and it ended up being profitable and gave me the confidence to, you know, go and do it again. So yeah, so that was my, that was my first, my first project. I'll, I'll mention that the, fu the, the financing on it was much different. I actually went to like a regular bank, got a regular loan, put 20% down, um, told them I was thinking about living on the first floor and they were like, that's good enough for us. And, uh, yeah. So, so that was how the financing worked back then. It's, you know, tremendously different today. Did you actually end up living on the first floor? Just out of curiosity. No, I didn't. <laughs> I, uh, I thought about it. I mean, the, the place was beautiful. And if, um, if I had held on to it myself and if I had gotten everything done myself, um, there's a good chance that I probably would have, I would have stayed, but maybe up on the top floor. Yeah. That was probably the time when Jersey city was hot too. Yeah. Uh, that, well, so Jersey, yeah. Jersey city at that point was, um, so all of the trading companies had just moved to Jersey city from wall street due to a, a tax law, uh, incentive or a tax 
incentive that Jersey was offering. Um, so I was taking a cab to work every day because it was it was not a good place to be, and it was you know it was, it was a little more on the violent side of things. And um, I started noticing like, hey, there's a forty story forty story building going up here, and a thirty one story here, and all these huge apartment complexes. And then I was like, oh. Goldman Sachs just bought this building. Um, you know, all these major banks were buying buildings in the area um, or building buildings in the area, I should say, because there was, wasn't much there at the time. And I started, you know, what I used to do is I would get on my bike and I would grab a notebook and I would just ride canvas, you know, blocks up and down and up and down and up and down. And I'd write down abandoned houses or I'd write down, you know, places that look pretty shitty for lack of a better word. And, I would look them up and I would try and find the owners and, and that was kind of, you know, what my deal was. But back then it was, yeah, I mean, you could have bought, you know, to put it in perspective that that building I talked about, I paid 541 for it. And if I would, if I could have held on to it to say just to, to like 2015, I probably could have got seven or 800,000 a unit. And it was a, it was a four, four family because it was, yeah, the, the the architecture and the, the you know it, it sounds just the beauty of the way it was built and the, you know, everything was twelve to fourteen foot ceilings with these inlaid French doors that would you know you could close off the living room from the kitchen. It was it was just a really it, it was building. It was you don't see building like that you know nowadays, which is really cool. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I used to play uh, basketball at the Hudson County Boys Club right off of Grand Avenue. Oh. And yeah, yeah, back in the day. And uh, and back then, like, the place was just a straight, free. It was just, it was very decrepit. It was, you know, you know just yeah. as most cities get. But I just took a trip to New York with my family, and I actually drove by the boys' club. It looks like night and day. Like, night oh, yeah. and day. Yeah. Like, there's builders, you know, 40-unit buildings going up every year. I just couldn't believe it. Like, back in the day, like, I could, I wouldn't, you wouldn't even just walk around. Yeah. Well, that was, I mean, that was, so uh, the reason I was taking a cab was because one of the guys that I work with got stabbed on the subway. So I was like, you know what, you know, I'm a, I'm a bigger guy. I'm you know, six back then I was six, four, 200 pounds. I was in great shape. You know, I wasn't really fearful of, of you know, of, of stuff, but you know, this dude literally got stabbed. You know what I'm saying? I was like, okay, well, you know, Stab, getting stabbed in the back is it doesn't matter how big you are so uh yeah that's why i was taking the cabs and like i said luckily you know i was above ground and i was looking around and noticing <laughs> what was going on so yeah kind of worked out would you say that uh first deal was one of your most challenging or do you have others that kind of just knocked you on your ass <laughs> um that was hands down the most challenging so yeah. um yeah i mean i've i've had Listen, I've had, I've had other real estate projects fail. I've had other business projects fail after that, but that was, yeah, that was the most difficult. That was the most stressful. And it was, you know, it was the first, it was the first one too. And I was only, I think I was like 23 years old. You know, I had no clue. <laughs> so yeah, it is. The, the thing that's weird is it causes me more anxiety and stress for reflecting on it than when I was actually going through it, <laughs> which is, yeah, it's kind of, kind of odd. Do you, do you think that your experience as a market maker helped you in your real estate career? And do you see any parallels with that? Can you share kind of like either the, the disadvantages, the advantages that you, that you, some skills that you learned being a market maker and translated into the real estate world? Um, that is an awesome question. Nobody's ever asked me that before. Uh, I'm going to say, yeah, uh, almost definitely. Um, the, I, I used to, when I was a market maker, I, I had friends of mine that were becoming lawyers or doctors or, you know, just things where you were going to school and, and you were building like, you know, a foundation that you could really live off of. And as a market maker, it was always the idea that you're going to just burn out um, and, you know, hopefully make enough to coast after that. And there's, I always tried to figure out what's the, like, what's the layover? Like, where is it? how is this actually going to help me somewhere down the road? And I, I got to say, uh, it took me a few years, you know, good five or six, it took me a long time to realize it, but um, I became excellent at pricing. Um, I used to, I could, I could really tell like where a market was going. Uh, and I'll also mention that in the middle of the, the market making, I, I, uh, 
I took a break, you know, it was, or just before the marketing, I, I took a break and I was down in, um, in Atlanta and I was selling cars down there. And I learned a tremendous amount about people and about reactions and, and just human nature. And so when I, when I coupled that with the market making and the ability to know, like, because market making was what's somebody willing to pay for something and what's somebody willing to sell something for. So once I had like a, an ability to talk to people and to read them a little bit and to understand what are their concerns or what, you know, what is it that they're actually looking for? Then I was able to understand where, what are they willing to pay or what are they willing to give this up for? Or like, what's their goal? You know what I mean? Like, are they, are they trying to make the most money as possible or do they just want to get down to Florida and have their everything paid off and, you know, and a little spending cash. So um, the market making definitely let me find like a, a truer price and it helped with everything with negotiating prices, with contractors, with suppliers, with people I'm trying, wholesalers, uh, you know, people I'm trying to buy houses with, um, so yeah, it definitely, it definitely helped, but in a, in a kind of surprising way. Nice. When, when did you uh, officially step down from, uh, working in the market? Um, it was probably about 2010, I would say 2011. Um, I was, so I got, when I started as a market maker, I would make about a, I didn't, I'd make an eighth to a quarter of a point. Of, of spread almost for whatever stock I was trading. Um, that got narrower and narrower, you know, smaller and smaller and smaller. And, you know, so I was making like eights and teenies, which were 16 that we used to call them teenies. And then we went to decimals and it went down to nickels and then it went down to pennies and then it went down to, so, so I ended up, so well, when I was working at uh, Sphere, which Goldman bought, which was where I originally, that was, I was making very good money. By the time I ended my career, I was trading volume wise more about 10 times the amount of volume that I was trading ever. Um, I was doing what were called corporate buybacks. So, um, so like when uh, Verizon or Exxon or it was Forbes 100 companies, when they would announce that they were going to buy back, you know, I can remember Verizon and we're doing a $1.6 billion buyback. And I would usually get a third to a half of that order. So they would say, all right, you have a month. You have to beat what was called the VWAP, the volume weighted average price every day yep. in order to keep the, the, the order. Um, if I missed it, it was like three times in a month or two times in a row. Then I get lost the order for like a year or two years, depending on what the penalty box was. It was a whole, it was a whole thing. Um, and I was trading, I mean, literally, 30, 30, 40 million shares a month. And I was making more money in what were called rebates by using the ECNs than I was actually getting paid for trading the actual stock. So the, the amount of risk, you know, we had, we had one hiccup on a, what was considered a small basket. It was just, a, it was like a couple million shares. Um, and in the last 15 seconds of the day, we lost the connection and I had about a third of the orders loaded up on that line. And at the end of the day, they never got executed, but I had to make them good. So I had a tremendous amount of positions. Um, you know, I, I owned and was short a bunch of stock the next morning and it ended up costing me like 65 grand. And I was like, why am I doing this? I mean, I, I made, I made like five grand on this order. I'm trading only like a million and a half shares and you know, and I'm losing 60 something thousand dollars just because of one stupid little error. Um, and, uh, I, I, at that time had also come up with the idea of, uh, one of my partners, uh, Craig, who he's, he's one of my best friends. We talk every day on the phone and he was telling me, Oh, I got money. I, you know, I'm, I've been day trading. And I was like, oh, I buy cheap housing in Philly. And he happened to be talking to John who was saying the same thing to him. And so they started buying property. And when I was, so in around, around 2010, I told my, the owner of the company I was at, like, I'm quitting. Um, my wife was, after a few tries, pregnant. And I was more the type of person that, if you're going to have kids, I think you should kind of take care of them. So wasn't looking the nanny route. And you know, she loved her job. And I had an opportunity to stay home. So I did. And I kind of hung out with the kids. And, and that's when Belltown Properties started, which 
like I was saying, you know, I started buying all the properties in West Philly with, uh, with Craig and John and yeah. And then that was it. The rest was, just, you know, kind of history. That was a great time to uh, start investing in real estate in Philly. You caught like the beginning of everything that happened there. Yeah, it was, um, it was, I will say an unprecedented time. Yeah. We would, it, yeah. it was funny because we still, we joke about it still today. Um, because if you remember, you know, it was the big mortgage crisis and, you know, everything's in play, it's the end of the world and banks are going under and all that. Um, for the record, I, you know, it's, I think the banks kind of should have failed because it would have given an opportunity for new technologies to replace all of the, what are still antiquated and still failing banking technologies. But um, that's a whole nother topic. Uh, but at the time, uh, if you remember, They'd written so many ridiculous loans to so many people that couldn't afford them. And Fannie Mae and, and Freddie Mac were just getting abused. I mean, they were they were taking back an insane amount of properties. Um, so I ended up getting on like their list and we started monitoring them. And it would it was insane because in, in West Philly at the time, um, they would put a house out on uh, Christian or Carpenter block, like, the, you know, 56, 5,700 block of, you, you know, fit Christian, let's just say. And they'd list the property 70, 75 grand. And then we would see it and be like, okay, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you 12, five. And they would uh, write in a scalding email and that would be the end. And they'd kind of tell us how that, we're crazy. And then like a month later, a few weeks later, they'd be like, how about 40? And we'd be like, how about 15? And they'd be like, oh, I'll screw you guys. And then, and this process would go on and it would go on with, you know, I've probably bought 20 properties from them. So there was always a bunch of them like in this process. And eventually, you know, they'd be like, how about 20? And we'd be like, all right, fine. Or, you know, how about 17? And they'd be like, okay, fine. So yeah, you were literally had the opportunity, um, I'm gonna say from about 2008 to about 2013 or 14 to, get tremendous deals. Um, I don't think, I don't know if we'll see that again because the, you know, they had so many, they had so many, so much bad paper on their books. And I believe that they were also guaranteed like 90% of their losses by the, you know, from the government for whatever, if they took losses selling them. So, you know, it was kind of a no brainer for them to just bail out at whatever price. And it was a no brainer for us to, to buy them at, at those prices. So yeah, you know, very speaking about taking back properties, just out of curiosity, when you guys have to take back a property, uh, cause I'm sure that, you know, and you do it sometime, uh, do you guys have any bad debt that you actually sell or are you always taking on the project? Um, so, you know, so knock on wood, you know what I'm saying? Uh, we have, we're, we've not been in the position where we've had to take a tremendous amount of properties back. Um, kind of what I was, you know, what I was saying in the very beginning, um, we all have a, a good background of, of how to get a project to completion. Um, so we, we much more take the approach of, listen, we need to open dialogue. You know, like if you're, if you're in trouble, if you're out of money, if your contractor, whatever, something happened, uh, you know, let me know because I have a tremendous amount of resources. So, we, we've been taking that approach. Um, you know, it was rough. I'm going to say anybody that bought a property, you know, let's say uh, by the end, like the end of 2000 and let me think here, 2021 to like the, you know, probably about a year, a year, year and a half after that. Um, I've seen a lot of like, that seems to be the danger zone. Um, once anybody that basically from, from the end of 2021 to, I would say the beginning of, not even the beginning, but until like maybe July of last year, um, August, I think those were the ones that the people really got in trouble because I think they overpaid or they paid the wrong prices. And we had a, a lot of people kind of hit speed bumps and, you know, like this doesn't make sense or I might lose money or, you know, just that, that feeling of, I should just kind of quit and walk away. Um, so, you know, we gave people that were in that situation options. Um, most of them decided, you know, maybe you could just help me and we could just work through it. So, uh, that's where we're at with most of them. Um, I know we did take one property back, uh, about a week and a half ago. 
but I think that's really one of the only ones we've taken back in, in quite a while. Um, so yeah, we, we would rather get the, yeah, we'd rather just help the person get, get it completed. And they, if they never want to do it again, that's fine. But this way, you know, at least, at least they don't feel like, ah, uh, that was terrible. So yeah. That's pretty good, yeah. man. It's a lot to be said about yeah. you got, you know, helping it, helping investors out, getting them through the project. It's very, it's very unfound because some people just say, no, I'm taking the property. So I can truly appreciate you, where you guys are coming from with that. Yeah. yeah good. Thanks. Um, yeah. We, we've seen some other lenders that have a, an opposite mentality and, and, you know, honestly, what we've learned and, you know, I was talking about how, Hey, it seems like there's a, there's a little, bump in, in things right now. Like it seems like things are kind of picking up or speeding up, which I don't think is going to last, but at least for maybe the summer. Um, and if for, for us, it's been, I'm going to say almost hundred percent repeat customers, just guys that have been kind of in the waiting in the wings for the past year or so waiting for stuff, dust to settle, whatever. Um, and it's, and I think it's, it has a lot to do because of that, that mentality. Because, well, you know, our mentality is, hey, you're brand new. You have no idea. You're scared. You don't know what to do. Come on. Well, you know, we can help you out. We'll show you how to do it. After you do it, you'll know how to do it. And not only can you do that as many times as you want with us in Philly, but if you move, you know, to the Carolinas, hey, you can go do it down there. Or if you move to Washington or Florida or whatever, it doesn't matter buying real estate is the same all over the country. So, you know, here's the skill, here's a, here's some knowledge and, and it'll help you build some actual wealth. So, yeah, you know, so that's kind of our mentality was that we've, we've taken people that have never built a house and then we've given them enough experience where they've gone off and gotten where, warehouse lines of credit and called me up and be like, I'm so sorry. I can, you know, we'll do a loan once in a while, but I got this much better deal. And I'm like, hey, that you know, great, because I'd like to do that for a hundred more people. So, yeah, that's that's kind of the mentality with it. Oh yeah, that's fantastic, Luke, and I can attest to that, man. You guys are definitely new investors. Um, uh, I was in that boat, man. You didn't even ask questions. You said, "Oh, Mike, Mike and Frank referred you." Yeah, <laughs> done. Let's go. Send me the deal. <laughs> that's great. So, you know, kind of forward looking at the market, you're kind of talking about, hey, it might speed up a little bit over the summer here. What do you think things really look like in this kind of crazy time that we're in right now over the next, let's call it three years, short term looking? What, what are your thoughts? Um, understanding that this is all just a big guess. Uh, I would, my guess is that we're seeing a little bit of a little pickup in things now, purely seasonal, at least in my opinion. Um, I think some, I think people that have projects that are not in good positions are kind of puking them out right now. Um, I think that's what's causing a little bit of this opportunity uh, and getting numbers right because people under be good because people that own properties that are not in a good position understand that now is buying season. And if they don't make a sale now and they get caught in the winter or, you know, or fall and, the, the, the interest level most likely just on a purely seasonal basis should should dip. Um, and then the thought of, oh, my God, I have to hold this for another 10 months or 12 months and whatever payments I'm making every month. Now I'm really, you know, so it kind of makes sense for me to take a loss, cut my loss, take a loss, whatever you got to do. Just do it now. Rip off the Band-Aid, um, you know, get it over with. So I think you're seeing a little bit of that. Uh Inventories are still, I believe, pretty low. So, um, you know, when things are hitting, people are getting a little excited. But like I said, people are starting to discount because they they don't want to miss this opportunity now. Um, so I think it's kind of I think you're just getting that little bump now. I don't think it's it's much to really get on anybody's radar screen. Um, but I do think that maybe next year around this time, um, I'm hoping interest rates are settled in more comfortable. Uh, you know, I think people are becoming much more accepting of rates, which is a, which is a huge thing. Um, I think that there's going to be a, a good amount of debt that gets put on by individuals. Um, you know, you gotta keep in mind people have 
been living, you know, pretty well, going out to dinner and vacations and, you know, pretty much doing what they want. And then all of a sudden you get this massive slowdown and you get inflation and you get high interest rates and you, you get all of these things happening all at once and you don't necessarily want to change your lifestyle. So, you know, credit cards, a little loan here, you know, you get the things in the mail, how you're approved, approved for all this stuff. Um, so I think that's been going on for a little while now for, you know, maybe a year or a little less. And I think what is, what may happen is people look down and all of a sudden they've got thirty, forty thousand $40,000 worth of bills that they didn't have, you know, a year or two ago. And they really start considering like, well, Hey, you know, rates, here they are, you know, whatever, six and a half percent, six percent. I kind of, you know, got to, they're not going to go down. I think everybody's under the impression and everybody realizes they're, they're, they're not going to go down. And if they do, it's not going to be down to 3% again. Um, honestly, I don't think we'll ever see that again in our lifetime. And you know, I was joking how I've never seen that in my lifetime and my parents have never seen that in their lifetime. So um, I think it's a once in a lifetime event. So, uh, yeah, so I'm hope, but I'm hoping uh, by about next year, um, you know, people will have taken some home equity lines of credit. The idea of 7% interest rate or 6% interest rate is a lot more acceptable. The idea of moving to where you really want to be is now, you know, like, hey, if I have all this debt, but I, I also have to believe that people have a good amount of equity in their houses because yeah. anybody that's owned a house for the past 10 years is, is almost anywhere in the country has done well. You know, so there's there's kind of that, and I, and not everybody's really been tapping that equity. So I think that'll get a little a little boost, or that'll keep things moving. Um, but I think by this time next year, that people will come, many people will be coming to terms with the fact that you know rates are not going down. Um, yeah, maybe I don't want to live in the city anymore, and I want to move to the suburbs, or maybe I don't want to live in the suburbs, I want to move to the city. Maybe you know. And I've kind of been holding off because, oh, my, you know, my best friend's got rates at 2.85% and I'm at six through six and a half percent. And I feel like an idiot, but give it, a, give it another year. I think it'll be accepted. And I think people will start moving again. And I think, you know, and I also think just from a, a super, from a different point of view, just from a, a, like a technical, like a charting standpoint, we're also kind of coming in like at the bottom. And I think that, you know, by this time next year will be coinciding with a with a much more flattening of that bottom curve and, and maybe a little turning up, which you know, which would also make make sense. So yeah, so I, I think I think we're kind of I think we're in an okay spot right now. I think we get a little worse before we get better. But I think by yeah, next year, for sure. I think maybe well, it's, it's 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 interesting from like a, a charting standpoint when you put. 2008 kind of the topping that happened in 07 and you compare it to the S and P chart, the Dow Jones chart today, they're eerily similar. Yeah. Eerily. Yeah. Very similar. I don't know if we have the same fundamental factors going on that happened in 2008, but I mean, when you look at the fact that we minted 80% of our currency in the last three years, you know, inflation's going sky high. The fed clearly has no idea what the hell they're doing. You know, when you kind of factor in all those things, man, I, I don't know. You know, I'm always the guy that wants to short the stock market aggressively. That's always who I've been, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? But, you know, when I, when I kind of look at these things, man, it's just, um, it doesn't look great. It doesn't look terrible, but it doesn't look great. So I don't yeah. know. Well, I'm, I'll agree with that for like the next year or so. Um, I don't think things look great. I think they, I think that, so, so my, my comparison of not looking great is I was trying to refinance a bunch of houses and I was successfully doing it at 2.93% interest rate. And then I had a batch of properties that I was working on and I was very excited about. And then all of a sudden I went past the 30 day window uh, lock in and I was getting rates at like 7%, I think it was, or just under. Jeez. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to, take a break. I don't want to see what goes on. Um, so I think a lot of people did that. You know what I mean? I think everybody just stopped. Um, I think there's been no movement and when there's no movement, things get stagnant and they get stale and they get infected and dirty. All right. So 
a lot of people speculate that, you know, since COVID and a lot of the, the bigger commercial buildings where people had a lot of overhead via lease, and now that the, the dynamic of, of the work shift has changed significantly, a lot of these commercial, you know, these commercial uh, property owners, I mean, they're trying whatever they can to fill their buildings up and they're having a challenging time. So given that that is the case, a lot of people begin to speculate like, okay, well, what's going to happen with all this commercial square footage? Um, can you speak to that? I mean, do you have any insight as to where do you think that that market is going? Um, that is a very good question too. And one I'm not as familiar with, I know, I know during COVID and at the beginning of COVID and, and, you know, after about two years of it, uh, a lot of, in the very beginning, all the commercial guys I know said, we're good for a year and a half. That's kind of our reserve level. Um, and then I know at about two years, there was some panic, but I did not see like, the puke selling that I expected. Um, I mean, it may have occurred. It's not really my market. So I haven't, I didn't pay as much attention to it. You know, I look much more at um, kind of the residential side of things, but uh, yeah, but I do know um, as an example, my wife works at Ernst and Young and I know they closed up a tremendous amount of space and actually moved from, you know, they're from New York to Hoboken. Um, so I know that there's been a, definitely a downsizing of office space, but I have to say, I, I you know, I got to think that there will be a creative solution to filling that space. Um, you know, I've seen, I've seen a lot of people going back to work. So I know the space is, get, is picking back up. Um, but yeah, I'm not, you know, it's, it's a good question. I should know a little bit more about it. Uh, so I don't, I'm not really hundred percent sure what's going on with all of that space. Like the, when, when some of the companies that I'm familiar with have given up office space, like, I don't know what, I don't know who's taking it. I don't know if it's just going back to get released or, you know, I'm not really sure what the situation is, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've listened to a couple of different individuals on kind of like what their thoughts were and most people kind of, they veered to the side of what China does where everything is a mixed use building. Right. Everything is mixed use and they just stack on top of each other. And, you know, and then and the whole building is just a community, essentially, where you live and you work in the same building. It's kind of odd, but um, I would imagine that that's probably the easiest and fastest way to kind of convert commercial unused space to, you know, because like that's why people like the WeWork, right? People like the yeah. WeWork, which shared yeah. office space. And imagine if you lived in the building, too. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, I just, that's just, again, I don't have the answer either, but I'm just trying to share some of the things that I've learned and, and could potentially see in the future. Cause that sounds like one of the best solutions I've heard thus far. Yeah. I, I, I definitely know that, um, like office space is being, um, not, not, not office space, but like a, uh, office rooms, you know, in these offices are, yeah. are, are kind of a commodity at this point. Um, I've been to a few, uh, I don't know, I'm into mediation lately. So I've been to a couple of the, a couple of like mediation uh, like events and, um, and they're all held at like kind of, you know, no, I shouldn't say all of them, but they're, a lot of them are held at, but they're just rent, you know, three or four different offices, um, or conference rooms rather in offices and, and that seems to be, you know, like a kind of creative solution. Um, yeah. And, I, and like I said, I do, it does seem like a going back to work has kind of come into play a bit too. Um, everybody I know that was home, you know, five days a week is now back to work probably three or four days a week. So it's, you know, I do think some of the office space is getting utilized. Yeah, I was uh, talking to a guy uh, last week who um, does syndication on like abandoned big box retailers and converts it to self storage, right? Because where else are you going to get a class A building like that for pennies on the dollar? And then in terms of a conversion cost, I mean, self storage is pretty cheap to set up. So and then you know his strategy is just, hey, what what type of valuation can I get on this, and how quickly can I exit from it? So seems like a pretty uh pretty good business model though. Yeah, there's a, um, a lot of Kmart's and you know Bed Bath and Beyonds and all these forty, fifty thousand square foot buildings with massive ceilings that are just 
going out of business. Amazon and Walmart are shutting them down. Yeah. See, that's what always, what always like just baffles me about this is, but as you're saying that I'm, 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 I live out in Long Island now and I drive down Long Island Expressway and they're building like two more. They, they, I mean, they tore down all these trees. They build these whole big, huge areas and they're building more like big box stores, which, which to me, I, I just don't, you know, I'm at the point where I don't really get it so much. I think there's, I believe there's just too much stuff. I don't know if that, that makes any sense, but yeah, like I, I can, from my house, I can go in three different direct 10 minutes in three different directions. Cause I can't go North because I would hit water and I can go to, I I'm at a home Depot or a Lowe's. You know what I mean? It's like, I can go five minutes in, in almost any direction and I'm at a Starbucks or I'm at a Seven Eleven, or I'm at a, you know, convenience store or something like there's there's you know same thing with cvs same thing with rite aid same thing with it's just you know it's crazy like the there's just so much stuff and i i i have a problem trying to figure out like how do how do all how do they keep these open like if if a best buy is going out of business here and another and a pc richards like another electronic store is opening up there I don't understand how that works. You know what I mean? Like, didn't the first one fail? Like, I don't, I don't know. It, it blows my mind. Um, like we, I see retail places go out of business and I see similar retail places fill them up. So I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm confused the whole time, like with all, you know, with COVID and with, with you're talking about decreased office space. I mean, you look at Manhattan, they're building things like crazy. You know what I mean? There's, there's commercial space going up all over the place. So yeah. it doesn't, I, I don't know. It, that, that market blows my mind. Like, I don't, I don't get it. I don't, when I look at, when I look at like one of these big box stores and I try to imagine the costs that go into keeping them open. And then I look around and I'm like, there's like 15 people here, you know, and there's 12 employees and like how, how, how do they pay the bills? Um, you know, so it, it doesn't, it just, it kind of blows my mind. And then the idea of, you know, they, like they're just opening up this whole new shopping center. They're going to put a Walmart in it, but there's already a Walmart within 15 minutes, like in, in a couple different directions of this one. So isn't it just going to absorb the customers from the other Walmarts? You know, like it doesn't, I don't know. I don't understand. It seems to, to me the the base of buyers is a, a semi fixed number, and the base of suppliers, like I hear, oh, you know, we're not doing well. We're not doing well. Yeah, we're building more. So I don't. Yeah. I don't. Yeah, it kind of. It kind of. It's so illogical to me that I have a hard time you know, wrapping my head around it, to be honest with you. I, I don't even know how retailers stay competitive when, you know, I, I bought new headphones on Amazon and they were $50 less than what Apple saw them for. And Apple products are supposed to be price locked. So it's like, I, and then you get next day delivery for free. I, I just right. don't understand how anybody stays competitive in that space anymore. I really don't. Yeah, I agree. That's what I, I, I totally agree. Like, I don't, I don't get it. I mean, I do understand that there's definitely... Like there's times I had, you know, this actually the computer monitor that we're on right now, that I'm using right now, I was using it. It fell off. I was moving some stuff. It fell off a desk. It broke. I needed a new one and I wanted it right away. So I went to Best Buy. I was able to get it. Like I can understand that mentality, but if I wanted a new monitor and I didn't just break mine and need want it replaced right away. And I could, yeah, like you said, I could wait a couple of days because really it's only like a couple of days on Amazon. Yep. I could search it up. I could research it. I could get a great price. I don't have to go anywhere. I don't have to be bothered. And boom, it's at my house. You know, like I, I, yeah, I don't understand how, I don't either. I don't understand how they stay in business or stay competitive because it's, the overhead seems just so ridiculous. 
Well, the good news is that none of us are in retail. That is the good news. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> so, Luke, what, what do you think the um, what do you think the development of Crowdcopia and kind of what your plans are? What does that What does that look like going forward over the next couple of years? How do you guys plan on growing, expanding? I just started. Um, well, we we now have a, a like a long term lending, like a DSCR type of lending up, um, set up with a partner of ours. Again, I'm starting to feel like right now might be a little bump time, to, a good time to kind of lay the foundation for next year. So um, we're starting a, like a long term lending campaign, uh, and then we're also on the hard money side. Um, so we kind of look at hey, who's doing stuff in our neighborhood? Uh, like I know I know West Philly. I could. I live in Long Island, but I could walk up and down the blocks in West Philly in my brain and tell you, you know, these are three bedroom, 980 square foot. These are, you know, four bedroom, 1180 square foot. I, I can tell you the layouts because I know the area well. So I think that um, I think that the the retail side is going to well. So what, I'm sorry, what I got a little sidetracked. So what I was saying was, um, I'm kind of starting to talk to people that are working in areas that we're familiar with. So, uh, you know, I can see when guys are, are lending or when guys are doing projects in West Philly and I can reach out to them. And this is, we have been recently just starting to reach out to people and say, Hey, you know, I see you're doing this project. I, you know, I, not only do I own a couple of houses right around there, but we've done 15 loans in the area in the past, you know, year or two, we know it. And, you know, maybe we should have a conversation about lending and most people are, are very receptive to it because you know builders or contractor guys doing these projects are looking for money and we're looking for you know customers so uh, it's usually pretty good you know it's usually pretty receptive um so yeah so i've actually i have guys right now uh, a couple guys that work with me you know work for me doing um some late cold calling and some, you know, emails and probably going to do a couple mailers, uh, just to get, get in people's heads. And, uh, yeah. And I, I keep telling them just, we got to get prepped for next year because I really do think that, you know, next year around this time, we're going to get, we're going to get busy. And I kind of want to, you know, I want to lay the relationship work now. I'm a, I'm a more proactive than reactive type of person. So, um, like I think there's, I think everybody's going to be reacting next year. Like, Oh, oh shit, what's going on? And I'm kind of trying to, you know, I want to have a hundred guys that I can call and be like, Hey, listen, starting to pick up, you know, are you picking up now? You know, and, and hopefully they're like, yeah, and I'm picking up customers and doing more projects. And so I, I you know, I'm hopeful, you know, crossing the fingers and, and hoping everything goes, but, uh, um, Thinking, you know, we've been pretty busy and we're, we're getting busier as we speak. Um, and we've been lucky to make it through COVID. We've been lucky to make it through all of the, you know, this interest rate bullshit. But, uh, you know, I think, I think there's, I think while we're still kind of nice and slow, I think it's a good time for people to really lay foundations, make connections, meet people. And I think we're having an opportunity next year to really take off. Nice. Nice. That's going to be a game changer with, uh, with the, with the perm financing. Yeah, sure. definitely. Yeah, definitely is uh, helpful for us. Definitely makes, uh, makes a big difference for us because, because the, the deal with them was they, um, they understand hard money lenders and they actually spent, they built the whole desk around a, a much larger national hard money lender, uh, about 10 years ago. So, um, you know, it, it just happened to turn out that the partner of it was a guy is the guy, one of the guys that I've used for all my personal mortgages over the last like 20 some odd years. So, um, it was a nice relationship. They understand the market and they basically gave us the kind of, Hey, if you guys underwrite them and you're good with them and they don't miss any payments and everything's cool. And you, you know, you don't have hiccups through the loan. You know, we're like 95% guaranteeing you 99%, you know, unless some oddity, you know, some whatever, some crazy thing happens, they'll take us out or they'll take them out. So it was, yeah. So it's a, it's definitely a good thing. Um, I've kind of stayed, stayed, steered clear of it for the last year or so with all the chaos going on. Um, but I've been able to successfully refinance a few houses just recently myself. And I think, you know, so I always like to do it first. If I, if I can do it, then I figure everybody else can do it. So 
Um, since I was able to do that and I got, you know, I was like five and a half percent rates, which were, I thought great. Um, yeah, we're trying to introduce the, the long-term lending now as well. Um, so, so two things. So just to clarify, so you'll, you'll do the hard and then you'll roll it over to the perm within, within yeah. your organization. Okay. I just want to, so we, well, so, so we did, all right. So, um, not as smoothly as you said. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a smooth, it's a smooth transfer, but the, we tried to do all of the, the perm financing in-house. Um, my partner, John did a tremendous amount of research and work and put a bunch of time into it. Um, I tried to help a little bit. Uh, and what we realized was it's huge. Like you, I, I mean, you gotta have seven to 10 years of lend of, of, like that kind of mortgage business experience just to, I think, even really consider doing it on your own. Um, so we realized it was a much too big of a lift. Um, and like I said, we just had this kind of rare opportunity with somebody who was already familiar with this and already doing it to kind of just link up with them. So, um, so it's a very, it's just a handoff. You know what I mean? Like, it's kind of like, Oh, Hey, you've got, you know, two or three months left in this loan here, why don't you start up with these guys so that when, when you're ready to go, it's not a three month process. It's, you know, you already got everything lined up, uh, you know, and we're here, we can, whatever documents that you've given us that, you know, you allow us to give them, we can just pass them along. We can, you know, we have a little file on you already. We can do everything. So it's, uh, it's just an easy process. It's a smooth process. Um, their rates are very competitive. I know we've, finance a couple guys that are very savvy with their rates and, you know, kind of taking them from other guys. So I know, you know, numbers wise, everything. Yeah. It's pretty good. So, uh, as Crowdcopia grows, I mean, your base is in Philadelphia. What's the appetite for other markets? You know, how far South, how far West do you think that you can go and analyze those markets to feel comfortable lending in them? Um, so we've been, uh, so we've done, done some lending in um in new jersey um down on the shore a couple other areas we've done some stuff in delaware um my partner craig's actually down in florida and we're thinking about we just have a, a pretty good network of people down there as well um so we're thinking about maybe you know kind of getting something going down there um yeah it's you know the the we want to expand. Um, the thing that is difficult when it comes to the actual expansion is the, it's, it's the people, you know, it's the, it's not, it's, what we have in Philly is a somewhat unique situation because, because you've got me like on the front lines, I'll tell you your deal sucks. Like just don't do it. You know what I mean? Or I'll tell you, this is great. Let's go ahead and do it. And then, so I'm like the first, if it makes it past me, then it goes to like our construction guys. And if they get in the house and they look at your budget. So what, what happens is, you know, you, the bar will provide us with what they believe the rehab budget is. And then we go in the house and put together a rehab budget as if we're buying it ourselves. Um, we compare the two budgets, make sure everything's, you know, lined up, looks good. Um, and if, if it does great, we use that for the draws. And if it doesn't, we let you know, like, hey, you know, you forgot framing or you didn't put the windows in or, you know, something. Yeah. And, and then, I mean, and it happens all the time. So, you know, so if the numbers look good for me, it gets through me. It goes to, to the construction guys. If if you gave me a fifty thousand dollar budget and it's really going to be 90, then, you know, that's probably going to kill the deal. If it makes it through the construction guys, then it goes into our underwriting and, you know, as long as you're not really a terrible person, um, that's usually the easiest part to get through. Um, you know, it's, it has become a little bit different. Uh, credit scores have, have do matter a little bit more than they used to, but that's only for only because to get out of it and to get away from us, you know, the banks have have changed their, their credit limits, you know, quite a bit. Like we, you know, 600 credit score, I could find somebody relatively easy without too much pain, you know, to get you finance. But now to get, you know, your cash out and your money back and all the, the RRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRRR
they're just starting to move up to like 75% LTVs. Um, I actually, with the, with the guy, I told you I refinanced a few houses not too long ago. Um, I had a call with them this morning and I was able to bump them up to 80, which is the only, I, like I, I have a lot of other people, you know, a lot of friends of mine that do similar things. And so far I'm the only one that was able to get them to consider 80. So, you know, it's, so it's changed things a little bit. You know what I mean? If, if, if your credit's not that great and your LTV is, you know, 70% or more, you probably should hold off. You know, that's kind of, that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, yeah. Well, can you share with the listeners any, you know, resources, books, podcasts that you listen to regularly or gain some knowledge from that, uh, you know, you can truly say has been uh, monumental in your growth? Um, yeah. So, I mean, I like to read a little bit of everything. Um, you know, most of the time, honestly, I get a lot of people that send me order like, Hey, check this out, check that out. Um, and I think that's cool. And I like it. Uh, I think some of the guys that get into the real, like analytical data side of things, um, oftentimes the, the information is kind of already old. Um, my favorite thing, and I think, you know, both of you guys will attest to this because I'm sure when we've talked in the past, I've asked you, you know, but what I always do is as I, when I, when I'm talking to people, I say, ask them, what do you think? You know, like, what's going on? What do you think of the market? What are you saying? What are you hearing? What are you feeling? Um, you know, cause it's amazing because everybody, you get older and you really start realizing everybody is just so different and, it, and it's really such a beautiful thing. And I can, you know, Mike, I could ask you, Hey, what do you think of the market? And Dom, I could ask you, Hey, what do you think of the market? And I could get totally two different perspectives that might have the end, the, you know, at the end be in the same place, but just from two totally different perspectives. Um, yeah. so yeah, so my favorite way to just see what's going on in the market is I just call people, you know, I like, I'm a, I'm a phone guy. I love, I love talking to people. I think a lot gets lost with texts and emails and, you know, and it's just, I don't know, you know, it's just, it's so much better. So yeah. So my, talk to a bunch of brokers. I talk to a bunch of lenders. I talk to a bunch of investors. I, I talk to, you know, new people I'm trying to get to, to borrow from me. I talk to, you know, guys that haven't borrowed from me in a while. And I wonder why. Um, so I spend a lot of time uh, talking and on the phone, just asking people, you know, what do you think of the market? What are you seeing? What are you feeling? Um, because yeah, because like I said, everybody's different. People feel things. People sense things, people see things, people hear things. Um, and if you can kind of tap into a little bit of everybody, you get, a, I think, a, a good kind of view of what's going on. No, for sure. That makes makes so much sense. And you're not wrong. You're one of the few lenders that I know that will just talk on the phone with me or with Mike for like hours at a time. And you just, it's like one of the guys hanging out. You know, that's the one thing I love about you, man. It's that awesome. anytime I call you, you pick up the phone and, we, it's like, uh, we, we, even if we haven't talked for months, it's like, you know, we just spoke yesterday. So that, that's, that's what I can say about that for sure. Yeah. So Luke, if you, if you, if you, if you didn't do real estate, right. Let's say you didn't do real estate and let's, let's say that, um, you didn't do the stock market. What, what do you think you'd be doing, man? Like, um, so let me think that's an excellent question. I think I know what it would be. Um, so I'll just give you a very brief story um, with the lending and with Crowdcopia. I've spent, you know, since COVID started um, till current, I've spent a tremendous amount of time uh, helping people get out of bad situations, whether it was with me or somebody else. And um, and then and, and I was at a, I play poker with these guys on Mondays, uh, you know, so I'm at this game and I'm like, yeah, you know, I wish that I go, I'm, you know what I'm going to do after this? I'm just going to, I'm going to start up a business. I'm going to call it problem solving. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take people's problems. I'm going to solve it. And that's all I do all day. That's all yeah, I that's do all, all I do all day. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I got kids. I got a wife. I got a bunch of customers in bad situations. I got, all I'm doing is solving problems. And, and I love it. Like I really... I enjoy it. You know, people are like, oh, this guy's bothering me. I'm so frustrated. I'm so angry. I'm like, did you just let me handle it? You know, I'll just listen and let me see what's really going on. Um, so, so I'm playing poker and I make this comment and a friend of mine, this guy, Mike, goes, ah, 
oh man, you just need to be a mediator. And I was like, a mediator? What, you know, what's that? And, uh, you know, so I left and he's like, if, you know, I'll help. Yeah. He it turns out he does advertising for, um, was AAA, the American Association of Arbitrators, which is, yep. yeah, very well known, you know, company. Um, they're kind of like the gold standard for arbitration and mediation. So he's like, Oh, you know, I, I do some work with them. I can introduce you to some people. And, um, I was like, well, that's really cool. And I ended up taking, you take like a 40 hour course. I got, my license. I did all that. Um, and then I just keep taking these courses. I was telling you, I was doing these like little competitions and things like that. So, um, if I had found out about, well, first, let me just say this. If I could have been a NASDAQ market maker for my entire life, I would have done that. I loved it. It was, it was gambling, poker, everything rolled into one. I, I, I need stress. Like I got to have some stress or else, or else I'll just sit around doing nothing. So, you know, it was like on Fridays, I was like, I wish it was Monday because I just wanted to trade. So yeah. if I could have done that forever, I would have done that. If somebody had introduced me to mediation way back then, there's a very good chance that's what I would have done. Um, but I do have to admit when I did do that first project in Jersey City, it was like, it was like an addiction. It was like, you know, we used to call it getting bit by the bug. And, and I was just because that was exciting to me, you know, but yeah, I probably would have been a mediator if, if I wasn't doing this now. Man, they make, uh, they make so much money too. So much money. Well, yeah. Yeah. I, well, so, so we had a, so what the other thing, so what kind of also helped get me on this path was we had a, one guy who was in a really bad situation. Um, the, the gist of it was, piece of heavy machinery was put on his project uh on his property and it was it had rained and the soil was damp and it sunk in and it pushed in the foundation of the neighboring property and that guy turned out to be an ex-judge who started up a law firm to sue people that do exactly what just happened so it was it was truly like a nightmare situation um and we got invited to a mediation and it was uh, a few different insurance companies, the mediator, um, Crowdcopia, and uh, and the, the person that um, that lived, you know, at the neighboring property. Um, and I watched this whole mediation go on, and I, I wrote down, "I'm like, this is what's going to happen." I'm like, yeah, "How can how can everybody not see that this guy?" The, 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 the ex judge, the, the new lawyer, he, he wins. He's going to win. He knows every single move. He knows every single rule and law. He will run circles around everybody. And I wrote down what I thought the outcome was going to be. And they did the mediation for the whole entire day. It went on for like nine hours. I was, I thought it was awesome. Uh, I thought some of it was comical the way they were talking about, oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to go soften this guy up and I'm going to go, I'm going to go, you know, you loosen this guy up a little bit. And they were saying all these, like, you know, it was just funny. And then it ended, there was no solution. And then, uh, about six months later, what I wrote down happened. And I was like, wow, like, this is really cool. And I loved it. And yeah. And by the way, the guy needs rumor has it like 45 grand that day for not even coming to a conclusion, which the, the money side of it, I mean, I believe he's got a 40 year, you know, record of being a mediator. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not like he just started off, he's banging out 40 grand mediation sessions, but, um, but even money aside, it was just, it was just a very, I, I like to help people. So it was a, it seems like a job where you could just do something that you love. And yeah. And that's, and I think that's like the key to kind of, you know, everything. Yeah. And it's, it's coincidental. I mean, I told Dom, I mean, he'll tell you, I said, look, man, we need to start a problem solving business. Cause we do that extremely well <laughs> that yeah. that's all, you know, if we could pinpoint the one thing, at least I, I'm speaking from my perspective, but I also know Dom's experience. I mean, if we could pinpoint one thing that we're good at is that we get deals to the table because we're able to solve the problems. Right. Exactly. So, yep. so if you ever want to start a problem solving business, well, I'll fucking sign up. Let's go. Let's go, Luke. We will, and we will crush the shit out of it. 
I'm in. It's uh, psmediationandconsulting.com. Get involved. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm, yes, that is, uh, I would love to do that. I think, uh, I think that would be like a nice little side project. I definitely talk about online. Man, I was just in um in arbitration for my other project that I have going on, right? And dude, it was like 126 grand for both sides just to get the arbitration scheduled. If you don't pay that, sorry, we're not going to trial. It's just like so crazy. And there's only three people on the panel. It's like so you're telling me these three people are about to make a quarter million dollars. This is so crazy to me. The thing is, is if you figure it out in the arbitration for that quarter million, you probably save yourself a million and a half if it went to court, you know, if it went to trial. Yep. Because mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, once, once, once that happens, it, it changes the dynamics of, of everything. So, yeah, it's, uh, I think much better to get things taken care of off the record. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. before it goes to trial. Yep. So before we wrap yeah. up here, is there anything um, else that you want to share with the listeners? Um, yeah. I mean, just kind of hang in there at this point, you know, keep your eyes open. Um, it's a, it's, it's going to be, I think a very fun and, and nice and unique time. Um, you know, we were talking about charts before. If you, if you looked at like a traditional kind of seven and a half years, uh, real estate cycle, you'll see we're kind of down at that bottom part, maybe starting to, you know, hit, hit the meniscus. I can't remember what it's called, but the bottom, bottom. Um, yeah, I think, I think just kind of hang in there for now. Um, keep your eyes open. I think deals are going to pop up. Um, it is a great, great time to network, uh, because the, the most important thing that I can stress to anybody that wants to do anything in real estate is relationships. You know, they got to have them. Uh, they're, they're, they are the most important thing. Um, and, and it's, and with real estate, it's such a, it's such a nice environment because in one way or another, everybody seems to be able to help somebody else. So, you know, if you're trying to sell a house or you're trying to buy a house, you're trying to do work on a house, you're trying to borrow money for a house, everybody, when it's, when you find that right synergy of, of good people where, Everybody just, everybody's head is in the right spot. You know, it's not, nobody's trying to scam anybody. There's no lies, there's no drama. When you can hit that, when you can find that nice rhythm, it, it's awesome. You know, and you get some contractors, you get some lenders, you get, you know, some partners that you can rely on, you get some eyes on the ground. It's a, uh, now's the time for, for building that. Now's the time, I think, for networking, because I think you got a good year to, to meet all of the right people. And, and then, you know, hopefully in about a year or so they're in place and you can start utilizing everything. Well, look, I really appreciate your time, dude. Uh, you've shared a lot of wisdom here. And like I said, I've worked with Crowdcopia before. I can, I can vouch for you. Everything you said was correct, accurate and true. So if there's anything I can do for you personally now or in the future, please let me know. Yeah, you know what? Let me redo another one of these somewhere down the road. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. I mean, you guys are both great guys. You know, I, I, I wish I could have helped you a little bit more with your other projects, but you know, everything, you guys are great guys. I'm glad we were able to do this and, and I would love to do another one, maybe somewhere down the road. Absolutely. Oh, cool. We got a uh, problem solving uh, Mike, Dom and Luke uh, company coming soon is what it sounds like. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, on the lookout. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. All right, Luke. All right, man. Take care, guys. Thanks for everything.